Comparison of American and British English, Wikipedia article audio. The English language was first introduced to the Americas by British colonization, beginning in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Similarly, the language spread to numerous other parts of the world as a result of British trade and colonization elsewhere and the spread of the former British Empire, which, by 1921, held sway over a population of 47570 million people, approximately a quarter of the world's population at that time. Over the past 400 years, the form of the language used in the Americas especially in the United States and that used in the United Kingdom have diverged in a few minor ways, leading to the versions now occasionally referred to as American English and British English. Differences between the two include pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary, spelling, punctuation, idioms, and formatting of dates and numbers. Although the differences in written and most spoken grammar structure tend to be much less than those of other aspects of the language in terms of mutual intelligibility. A small number of words have completely different meanings in the two versions or are even unknown or not used in one of the versions. One particular contribution towards formalizing these differences came from Noah Webster who wrote the first American dictionary with the intention of showing that people in the United States spoke a different dialect from Britain, much like a regional accent. Word Derivation and Compounds Vocabulary This divergence between American English and British English has provided opportunities for humorous comment, e.g., George Bernard Shaw has a character say that the United States and United Kingdom are two countries divided by a common language, and Oscar Wilde that we have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, the language. Henry Sweet incorrectly predicted in 1877 that within a century American English, Australian English, and British English would be mutually unintelligible. It may be the case that increased worldwide communication through radio, television, the Internet, and globalization has reduced the tendency towards regional variation. This can result either in some variations becoming extinct or in the acceptance of wide variations as perfectly good English everywhere. Although spoken American and British English are generally mutually intelligible, there are occasional differences which might cause embarrassment for example, in American English a rubber is usually interpreted as a condom rather than an eraser, and a British fanny refers to the female pubic area while the American fanny refers to an ass or an arse. Note, a lexicon is not made up of different words but different units of meaning, including idioms and figures of speech. This makes it easier to compare the dialects. Though the influence of cross-culture media has done much to familiarize Brie and AIM speakers with each other's regional words and terms, Many words are still recognized as part of a single form of English. Though the use of a British word would be acceptable in AIM, most listeners would recognize the word as coming from the other form of English and treat it much the same as a word borrowed from any other language. Most speakers of AIM are aware of some BRI terms although they may not generally use them or may be confused as to whether someone intends the American or British meaning. It is generally very easy to guess what some words, such as driving license, mean. However, use of many other British words such as NAF are unheard of in American English. Overview of Lexical Differences Speakers of Brie are likely to understand most common AIM terms, examples such as sidewalk, gas, counterclockwise or elevator, without any problem, thanks in part to considerable exposure to American popular culture and literature. 
Certain terms that are heard less frequently, especially those likely to be absent or rare in American popular culture, e.g., copacetic, are unlikely to be understood by most free speakers. Words such as bill and biscuit are used regularly in both aim and brie but mean different things in each form. In aim a bill is usually paper money though it can mean the same as in brie, an invoice. In aim a biscuit is what in brie is called a scone and a biscuit in brie is in aim a cookie. As chronicled by Winston Churchill, the opposite meanings of the verb to table created a misunderstanding during a meeting of the Allied forces. In Brie to table an item on an agenda means to open it up for discussion whereas in AIM, it means to remove it from discussion, or at times, to suspend or delay discussion. Words and phrases that have their origins in Brie The word football in Brie refers to association football, also known as soccer. In AIM, football means American football. The standard aim term soccer, a contraction of association, is of British origin, derived from the formalization of different codes of football in the 19th century, and was a fairly unremarkable usage in Brie until relatively recently, it has lately become perceived incorrectly as an Americanism. In international context, particularly in sports news outside English-speaking North America, American news agencies also use football to mean soccer, especially in direct quotes. Similarly, the word hockey in Brie refers to field hockey and in AIM, hockey means ice hockey. Words with completely different meanings are relatively few. Most of the time there are either words with one or more shared meanings and one or more meanings unique to one variety or words the meanings of which are actually common to both pre and aim but that show differences in frequency, connotation, or denotation. Words and phrases that have their origins in aim Some differences in usage and slash or meaning can cause confusion or embarrassment. For example, the word fanny is a slang word for vulva in brie but means buttocks in aim the aim phrase fanny pack is bum bag in brie. In aim the word pissed means being annoyed whereas in brie it is a coarse word for being drunk. Divergence Similarly, in aim the word pants is the common word for the brie trousers and knickers refers to a variety of half-length trousers while the majority of Brie speakers would understand pants to mean underpants and knickers to mean female underpants. Words and phrases with different meanings Sometimes the confusion is more subtle. In aim the word quite used as a qualifier is generally a reinforcement, for example, I'm quite hungry means I'm very hungry. In Brie quite may have this meaning as in quite right or quite mad, but it more commonly means somewhat, so that in Brie I'm quite hungry can mean I'm somewhat hungry. This divergence of use can lead to misunderstanding. It is increasingly common for Americans to say happy holidays, referring to all, or at least multiple, winter holidays especially when the subject's religious observances are not known. The phrase is rarely heard in the UK. In Britain, the phrases holiday season and holiday period refer to the period in the summer when most people take time off from work and travel. AIM does not use holiday in this sense, instead, using vacation for recreational excursions. Other ambiguity In AIM, the prevalent Christmas greeting is Merry Christmas which is the traditional English Christmas greeting, famously found in the English Christmas Carol We Wish You a Merry Christmas, and which appears several times in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. In Brie, Happy Christmas is a common alternative to Merry Christmas. Both Brie and AIM use the expression I couldn't care less to mean the speaker does not care at all. 
Some Americans use I could care less to mean the same thing. This variant is frequently derided as sloppy, as the literal meaning of the words is that the speaker does care to some extent. In both areas, saying, I don't mind often means, I'm not annoyed, while I don't care often means, the matter is trivial or boring. However, in answering a question such as tea or coffee, if either alternative is equally acceptable an American may answer, I don't care, while a British person may answer, I don't mind. Either sounds odd to the other. A number of English idioms that have essentially the same meaning show lexical differences between the British and the American version, for instance. Asterisk in the U.S., a carpet typically refers to a fitted carpet. Frequency Generally, a non-restrictive relative clause is one that contains information that is supplementary, i.e. does not change the meaning of the rest of the sentence, while a restrictive relative clause is, one which contains information essential to the meaning of the sentence effectively limiting the modified noun phrase to a subset that is defined by the relative clause. An example of a restrictive clause is the dog that bit the man was brown. An example of a non-restrictive clause is the dog, which bit the man, was brown. In the former that bit the man identifies which dog the statement is about. In the latter, which bit the man provides supplementary information about a known dog. A non-restrictive relative clause is typically set off by commas, whereas a restrictive relative clause is not, but this is not a rule that is universally observed. In speech, this is also reflected in the intonation. Writers commonly use which to introduce a non-restrictive clause, and that to introduce a restrictive clause. That is rarely used to introduce a non-restrictive relative clause in prose. Which and that are both commonly used to introduce a restrictive clause. A study in 1977 reported that about 75% of occurrences of which were in restrictive clauses. Holiday Greetings H. W. Fowler in a Dictionary of Modern English Usage of 1926 followed others in suggesting that it would be preferable to use which as the non-restrictive pronoun and that as the restrictive pronoun, but he also stated that this rule was observed neither by most writers nor by the best writers. He implied that his suggested usage was more common in American English. Fowler notes that his recommended usage presents problems, in particular that that must be the first word of the clause, which means, for instance, that which cannot be replaced by that when it immediately follows a preposition though this would not prevent a stranded preposition. I am going to the store. Style guides by American prescriptivists, such as Brian Garner, typically insist, for stylistic reasons, that that be used for restrictive relative clauses and which be used for non-restrictive clauses, referring to the use of which in restrictive clauses as a mistake. According to the 2015 edition of Fowler's Dictionary of Modern English Usage, an aim which is not generally used in restrictive clauses, and that fact is then interpreted as the absolute rule that only that may introduce a restrictive clause, whereas in Brie either that or which may be used in restrictive clauses, but many British people believe that that is obligatory. Before the early 18th century English spelling was not standardized. Different standards became noticeable after the publishing of influential dictionaries. For the most part current Brie spellings follow those of Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language while AIM spellings follow those of Noah Webster as an American Dictionary of the English Language. In Britain, the influences of those who preferred the French spellings of certain words proved decisive. 
In many cases AIM spelling deviated from mainstream British spelling, on the other hand it has also often retained older forms. Many of the now characteristic AIM spellings were popularized, although often not created, by Noah Webster. Webster chose already existing alternative spellings on such grounds as simplicity, analogy, or etymology. Webster did attempt to introduce some reformed spellings, as did the simplified spelling board in the early 20th century, but most were not adopted. Later spelling changes in the UK had little effect on present-day US spelling, and vice versa. I am going to the store, I am going to the store. There have been some trends of transatlantic difference in use of periods and some abbreviations. These are discussed at abbreviation periods and spaces. Unit symbols such as kg and hertz are never punctuated. Idiosyncratic differences. Figures of speech. Equivalent idioms. Style. In British English, marks are often referred to as brackets, whereas are called square brackets and are called curly brackets. In formal British English and in American English marks are parentheses, are called brackets or square brackets, and can be called either curly brackets or curly braces. In both countries, standard usage is to place punctuation outside the parenthesis unless the entire sentence is contained within them. In the case of a parenthetical expression which is itself a complete sentence, the final punctuation may be placed inside the parenthesis, particularly if not a period. Linguist Braj Kishru, quoted by the Christian Science Monitor in 1996, stated that American English is spreading faster than British English. The Monitor stated that English taught in Europe, India, and parts of Asia and Africa is more British-influenced, however, informal English use outside the classroom is more influenced by the United States, Americans greatly outnumber Britons, in addition, as of 1993, the United States controlled 75% of the world's TV programming. A BBC columnist assessed in 2015 that American English is the current dominant force globally, like it or not. Use of that in which in restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. Writing. Spelling. Punctuation. Full stops and periods and abbreviations. Parentheses slash brackets. Demographics Sources